Hello, it's Jeffrey Christian of CPM Group. It's about 4.35 on Thursday afternoon, uh, the 31st of March. I'm recording this for release on April 1st. Once again, I am involved in a project this week that uh, in South Africa, which keeps me tied up on the mornings uh, all week long. So I'm recording on Thursday evening for Friday morning. Um, I wanted to talk today about what an inverted yield curve is and what it means, both in terms of a potential move toward a recession and also in terms of what it means for precious metals. Uh, and I'm going to do that because there's been a lot of talk about how the world is moving toward, why is it doing that? Um, the world is moving toward an inverted yield curve and that means that we're probably heading toward a recession very short. I want to talk about, you know, well, what is the uh, inverted yield curve? What's a yield curve? What's an inverted yield curve? What does it actually um, signal about a recession or a potential recession? You know, what's the actual relationship between interest rate inversions and recessionary economic conditions? What does any of this mean for gold and silver and platinum group metals? Uh, you know, Probably I should talk about other issues too. Uh, I'm paying more attention to the uh, spreads. Uh, we have a very low spread between treasury securities and corporate uh, interest rates. And I think that that signals that the financial markets are perhaps undervaluing risk at this time. Uh, and I will be watching for the credit spread between treasuries and corporate and private uh, consumer debt to widen as a signal of potential problems, more so than an uh, inverting yield curve. So I think that's one of the things that we want to look for. And then tying all that together, what are our shorter term price expectations for precious metals as we move into early April? So. Those are the things that I, I will talk about. So what is a yield curve? This is a yield curve. This is the one that most people look at, which is 10-year treasury notes less a two-year treasury note. And when people are talking about inverted yields, this is the one that they most often look at. I prefer a yield curve that shows you everything from you know one month and three month treasury bills out to 30-year bonds, and you can see the entire spread. I think that's a lot more informative, but this is what a lot of people focus on. And they look at, you know, the, the gray areas uh, are recessions, and they look at the relationship between the 10-year and two-year treasuries, and they see that it often goes negative in the run up or lead up to a recession. Not always, but sometimes. Uh, and the relationship, I think, is probably best characterized as sometimes you have an inverted yield curve but already into a recession, sometimes you have an inverted yield curve before you get into a recession, and sometimes you have one during a recession. And I think the relationship is similar to other relationships we've talked about in these videos. It's more of a correlation you tend to see that kind of inverted yield curve when you have recessionary conditions. But the onset of a recession does not necessarily cause an inverted yield curve, nor does an inverted yield curve cause the onset of a recession. I think that they often reflect the same sort of thing. You may remember that when talking about interest rates, I often say that it's much more important for a to it's often more important than the actual interest rate moves uh, to understand the reasons behind the interest rate moves. If interest rates are rising, for example, because inflation is rising, to wonder are the people who are pushing interest rates higher, are they pushing interest rates higher because they are afraid that the Fed cannot control inflation and inflation will get the upper hand? 
uh, which would be bullish for gold and silver and possibly bearish for the overall economy and industrial metals like platinum group metals? Or are they seeing interest rates rise because they think that the Fed can control inflation and will control inflation and that the rise in interest rates will quell inflationary pressures, sterilize some of the inflationary uh, uh, effects of previous monetary accommodation and fiscal largesse and stimuli, uh, and, and there, therefore inflation will come down. And in that kind of environment, it's not necessarily bullish for gold and silver, but it's probably more bullish for industrial metals like platinum group metals because it suggests that the economy, the real economy will continue to grow in a healthier way than it is at that period of time. So it's always important to understand why interest rates are moving and why the interrelationship between interest rates are moving. What is the relationship between a two-year note and a 10-year note? And why would that happen? That why would that shift? What is the relationship between treasuries and sovereign uh, currency uh, interest rates and benchmarks and corporate debt? So I think you really have to pay a lot of it, attention to it. And the reason that also applies for the yield curve is that there are a lot of things that influence or can influence the yield curve, and not all of them point to an imminent recession. For example, you could have recessionary economic conditions on the horizon and the yield curve goes high. All of a sudden, people start saying, okay, I have a greater uh, concern about near-term economic conditions than long-term economic conditions, so I want to charge a higher interest rate if I'm lending money on a two-year basis than a 10-year basis. It doesn't have to be a recession. You could see lenders actually thinking that you're going to see lower inflation without a recession, and therefore you're looking at a higher interest rate on a short-term basis than you are, a two-year basis than you are on a 10-year basis. That's something like the withdrawal of quantitative easing and accommodation, where the Treasury and the Fed stop buying long-term bonds, and that actually push, you know, the, the quantitative easing has pushed long-term bond interest rates down and the withdrawal of quantitative easing uh, and accommodation causes longer term rates to rise again. Um, and there are possibly other factors. There's a lot of complex issues related in the yield curve and it doesn't necessarily always point to a recession. Now, as I said, most people who focus on the yield curve look at the 10-year versus the two-year treasuries. But you can look at a whole raft of things along that yield curve, and I think that's very telling. If you look at 10-year treasuries less three-month treasuries, so really short-term interest rates, the 10 years have been rising relative to the short-term rates, and you don't necessarily, you don't see uh, us approaching negative or inverted yield curve and you don't see that kind of issue. Again, yes, we've seen an inverted yield curve in advance of previous recessions, but you don't necessarily see us moving toward an inverted yield curve at this point in time. So you've got to pay attention to those sorts of things. Bottom line is what's the relationship between an interest rate inversions and recessionary economic conditions? Oftentimes, they both are brought on by a confluence of other third-party independent issue uh, variables. So you could see being a recession already, or you could be within two years of a recession when you see that yield curve starting to move. And again, those of you who have seen these videos in the past know that we have been, a CPM Group's projection has been for a possible recession possibly around 2024 or 2025, 2026, in that period of time. So two to four years from now, that's a little bit far out uh, for a yield curve inversion at this point to be suggesting an imminent recession. What does it all mean for gold and silver? Well, again, it, what matters more is why the yield curve is changing. 
if you are moving toward a recession or you are having the kinds of economic and financial market instabilities and uncertainties that lead to recessions, then it could be good for gold and silver and bad for platinum group metals. But if you're seeing it as a sign of a readjustment in a post monetary accommodation and fiscal stimulus situation, then it could be less bullish for gold and silver and more bullish for platinum group metals. Um, all of that leads up to the view, what are our CPM group shorter term price expectations for precious metals as we move toward April? Uh, we've seen a very interesting first quarter. Uh, it started off with the markets focusing on inflation and inflation expectations and the idea of higher inflation. Then the markets started shifting over to focus on the idea that interest rates were going to start rising with the Fed raising interest rates in March, which it did. Uh, but before that even happened, you had the Russians invade Ukraine and that all of a sudden came into factor. So you've had these three big things, inflation, interest rate, increases and war based on Russia invading Ukraine uh, as, as the three big factors that you're looking at in the first quarter, which have caused a great deal of uncertainty, great deal of price volatility and higher prices. Our view is that over the next nine months, the rest of the year, you will see more stable economic conditions and more stable economic expectations in financial markets. And those expectations probably are more important than the actual underlying economy. The second quarter, April, May, June, probably is not going to be all that great. We've seen weak uh, economic growth in the United States and some other countries in the first quarter. You've got a war going on. That war is not going to be resolved in, in the first week of April. It's going to be around for some time. Over the course of the second quarter, we do think that you will either see a clear path toward a resolution of the war, or you might actually see a resolution of the war. The aftermath of that war is going to be a lot of reorganization and realignment of political, economic, financial market, commodity market uh, realities. So it's going to continue to be muddy. War and its effects are going to affect the world for years to come. But our expectation is that once you get into the third and fourth quarter, the second half of this year, you might see uh, financial markets much more comfortable with economic growth for a time. We'll be that much closer to the end of the expansionary cycle, but that's beside the point for those, those expectations. Uh, one of the reasons why we say that is we think that interest rates will have been increased by the Fed several times by the time you get into uh, July, August, September, and they will not have caused a recession in the economy. They may have lowered growth a little bit, but they probably will be having a more positive effect on reducing inflation. Inflation, we also expect to, to, to see lower price rate increases showing up. If you look at the inflation rates over the last year in the first quarter of 2021 the increases in prices were relatively low they started increasing in april may june and they got very high in that period they came off in the third period and then they rose in the fourth period our expectation is that as you go forward you know we're now looking working off of february cpi data which came out on march 10th We'll get the March data in the second week of, of April. And the prices really heated up in April, May, June of last year. So you won't see CPI data for April, May, or June 2022 until May, June, July. But when that data starts coming out, just arithmetically, the growth rate in price levels probably will slow. And that is the inflation. I'm not saying that prices are going to come down, but they probably will not rise as quickly year over year in the second and third quarters of this year as they did in the second and third quarters of last year relative to the previous year. So we think that inflation rates as reported and as really exist 
probably will be coming down and you'll start seeing that in May, June, July, and August. That'll contribute to a more positive economic expectations on the part of financial markets. So our expectation is that precious metals will come off price-wise a little bit in the second and third quarters of this year. There are some flies in the ointment. You know, there probably will be a resolution in the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but it's going to be sloppy and it's going to have a lot of negative consequences for various parts of the world. You have the U.S midterm elections, which are clearly going to be very hostile and dysfunctional and divisive. And that's going to create some uncertainty and, and, and ill ease in financial markets. And Europe, you know, when you look at Europe prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there were a lot of issues and disagreements emerging in Europe. There were any number of people within Europe who were saying, hey, the British might be right. The EU as a massive bureaucratic institution may not be as relevant and necessary as it seemed like it should be 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. You had Hungary and Poland that actually talking about leaving the EU because they were upset with some of the social policies that the EU said that Hungary and Poland and other countries that were members of the EU had to follow. That's all been set aside by the greater uh, threat and risks posed by a militant Russia invading the Ukraine. But when that war is behind us or moving toward a resolution, those decisions are going to come back out and be rediscussed and redecided. And you're going to be doing that economic and political environment in Europe than what existed before late February. So there are a lot of issues that can probably upset the apple cart of the economy over the next nine months. But there are also issues that suggest that the economy itself will probably look better, especially in the second half of this year, going into 2023. In that kind of environment, we expect gold prices and silver prices to do what they did last year, which is to calm down and move sideways at very high levels. And yes, gold is gold price, and silver at $24 to $26 an ounce is a high silver price, despite what some people think or believe or say. Um, so I think that that's the case. Auto industry probably will continue to improve itself, and you'll probably see increased demand for platinum and plating rhodium because these metals come heavily from Russia. Uh, Russian supplies are not interrupted. They probably will not be interrupted, but there will be an increased risk premium put on platinum, palladium, and rhodium because of the Russian uh, supply issues. So platinum, palladium, and rhodium probably will also stay somewhat higher. We do expect palladium and rhodium to resume the downward trend that we saw from these historic highs, uh, record highs, uh, that we were seeing late in 2021, we do think that that will resume while platinum probably continues to try to build a base around $1,000 an ounce in expectation of higher prices later. So that's our view as of the end of March, the end of the first quarter. Uh, we'll talk to you again next week. We will be launching our gold yearbook uh, next Wednesday. I have talked about it. You can register for the free online briefing, which will be on Wednesday, uh, the 6th of April. Uh, we'll, we may do the Tuesday video on Monday, since we'll be doing the Gold Yearbook on Wednesday, uh, but we'll mention the Gold Yearbook and give you a little bit of a preview of some of the data uh, that in it uh, in our next video early next week. Have a good weekend, take care of yourself and take care of the people around you. I'll talk to you next week.